So I'm going to kick it off. Good afternoon, everyone. We're very excited to have Dr. Corey Anderson here. My name is Dr. Alexandra Reed. I'm a lead veterinarian in the Animal Health and Welfare Branch of OMAFRA. And I'm here as the co-lead of the Wildlife Ontario, Ontario Animal Health Network, which we call OWEN, along with Dr. Claire Jardine from the Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. OWEN functions partly to share disease information with veterinarians and the public, so we're really glad that Corey could come and talk to us today. Uh, Dr. Corey Anderson is the co-director of SIDRAP's Chronic Wasting Disease Program, which focuses on CWD spread among cervids and the potential transmission to human and other animal species. He joined SIDRAP in 2019 and helped launch the CWD program that year. He's coming to us with a PhD and master's in public health in environmental health sciences from the University of Minnesota. I thought it was a really wonderful talk on the issues around CWD positive carcass disposal, and I think as one of the last remaining CWD free provinces. He's going to share a lot of really valuable information with us today to stay that way, hopefully. Um, CWD is a disease that really doesn't fit neatly into one box. It's a wildlife disease, it's domestic animal disease, and there's such significant environmental contamination. It really requires multiple levels of government working collaboratively together to really resolve outbreaks. And um, one of the things that's very exciting is with funding from the Minnesota legislature, SIDRAP's Chronic Wasting Disease Program has initiated collaboration with national and international experts to draft comprehensive guidance um, for any potential spillover to humans or non servid production animals. Um, and this is a really unique approach that no one else has pulled all these disciplines together to address the risk of a CWD spillover event. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Corey, and we're going to hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So thanks very much, everyone. Perfect. Thank you, uh, obviously, for the opportunity. It's always fun to talk about uh, CWD as opposed to COVID, which uh, used to be the topic of the day for our group here for three or four years. So I know that's probably not a great sign that CWD is fun to talk about, but I do think, uh, you know, it's an important topic and it's a little less heated than COVID. So I enjoy it. And like I said, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, as mentioned, I'm Corey Anderson, and I will try to leave plenty of time for questions. That said, uh, this is going to be sort of a smorgasbord of CWD updates, um, somewhat of a journey uh, where basically I'll take you through just sort of an overview, although many of you might be familiar with it. I'll touch on the work that I did for my PhD project, which focused on carcass disposal. Um, and then towards the end, in case there is any interest, I'll just uh, give a brief overview of what SIDRAP and our team is doing on relation to the whole One Health approach to CWD. So hopefully it doesn't take too long, but if I go a little fast, I got to get through these slides. So anyway, um, again, as always, I always debate taking this out, um, but just in case people aren't super familiar with prions, prion diseases. Um, I think it's always important to just frame that it's a little unique compared to, to viruses and bacteria and that uh, with prions, we actually know that there is a normal prion protein. It gets a little confusing on the lingo considering that, you know, we talk about this normal prion protein. Um, but importantly, this is expressed in a whole variety of, of animals, including all mammals. So all of us have it. It's formed by a single gene. Um, when it functions properly or sort of as it does naturally, um, it's actually highly soluble. Um, it gets digested fairly quickly after it's expressed. Uh, and it's one of science's sort of remaining mysteries in that we don't exactly know its entire function. And we may not even care um, what its function is or even know about normal prion proteins if it weren't for sort of this misfolded form, um, which brings us to our, our bad actor in all of this. Um, and these are the disease causing prions that we're going to be talking about today. Um, in terms of prion diseases as a whole, there's three sort of ways that they can be introduced um, into, a, into a potential host or sort of seed an infection. Uh, they can occur sporadically. Um, that happens um, human prion diseases with sporadic Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Um, it's actually the most common, although it's still rare, um, but that's sort of a sporadic form. Um, there are genetic prion diseases, and then, of course, there are infectious prion diseases as well. And what these disease-causing prions are, they're really just a misfolded form of that normal prion protein I mentioned in the last slide. Um, although we don't know a lot of the exact mechanisms, we do know at this point that they really act as a template for disease. Um, for whatever reason, they bind to normal prion proteins and convert them to a misfolded form. And it's kind of this daisy chain reaction that occurs. You can see that in the image. Um, well, if, if you're familiar with prion diseases, you probably know that they're sort of characterized by this 
prolonged incubation period. Uh, it's likely due to the slow accumulation of these disease-causing prions in the misfolded form. Um, and then, of course, another sort of notorious characteristic of prions that they're highly resistant agents uh, can withstand a lot of the treatments that would uh, inactivate a virus or a bacteria, including heat there you can see, which sort of has uh, implications for the discussion with disposal, where it can uh, withstand potentially up to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, just an overview of CWD. Again, I don't know if a lot of this is probably redundant for folks, so hopefully it's not too boring. Um, but just to, to fill people in if they're not familiar, uh, it is an invariably fatal prion disease in cervids, so deer, elk, moose, and caribou. On average, uh, the incubation period for this disease is 18 to 24 months. So again, fitting that pattern of uh, prolonged incubation period. Of course, with this incubation period, it's, it's the time from exposure and infection to showing symptomatic uh, disease. So you can see that's quite prolonged. Uh, they're basically walking around appearing totally healthy for, for that time. Um, despite the lack of symptoms, and this goes to one of the many challenges of managing the disease, um, it, it appears that for most of that incubation period, they're, they're actively shedding infectious CWD prions in a variety of bodily fluids. You can see saliva, urine, feces, antler, velvet, semen, sort of you name it, and they are, are shedding these prions again while appearing totally healthy. Uh, if they do end up making it throughout that entire 18 to 24 months, um, they would end up showing uh, clinical symptoms of the disease. Again, wasting obviously is, is a pretty key characteristic and plays into the name. Um, and inevitably they would end up succumbing to their infection. Uh, a couple of other key points is that we do not have a vaccine or an effective therapeutic for CWD. Um, you might hear some talk about genetic resistance, and there is certainly a genetic component uh, that can play a role in susceptibility to CWD. However, I think at this point, it's, uh, it's important to clarify that we don't have a complete genetic resistance when it comes to CWD. If anything, it looks like, uh, again, it plays into different levels of, of susceptibility where maybe uh, if they have certain genotype, they might have a longer incubation period and be able to survive or maybe might not be as easily infected. Again, there's a lot of unknowns, but no complete genetic resistance. And then of course, another key point is that at this time, there is no evidence that CWD has infected humans and hopefully that remains true moving forward. Uh, this is always an unfortunate map that many of you have probably seen, uh, but just the latest distribution of the disease at this point has been detected in 32 U.S. states um, and five Canadian provinces. Uh, and you can see that in some of these states, it's it's fairly well spread and others it might be isolated to certain areas. So it's sort of this different picture. But the, the moral of the story is that the disease keeps spreading and we keep finding it in new areas. Uh, this is no news uh, that... To, to folks from Canada, British Columbia, actually just recently, earlier this month, um, reported that they found their first cases. Um, so again, it's this unfortunate story of a disease that, uh, again, keeps spreading, and we don't have a lot of great uh, solutions for at this time. Um, but again, the consequences, I think, are uh, warrant responses uh, and, and searching for better tools and options. So, um, and admittedly, I'm biased on the subject I am from. Southwest Wisconsin, where CWD is is all too common, uh, and grew up in a family that hunts, and so I am also one of those who is sort of holding out for better tools and options, as many of you are. Of course, it's not just a North American problem; it has been detected elsewhere as well. Uh, here's a list of the countries you can see: South Korea detected it in 2001. Otherwise, the Scandinavian countries have had a more recent experience with it. Um, Norway in particular, I think, uh, has made quite a few headlines in their um, fight against CWD, which has been a bit more uh, involved compared to, to Finland and Sweden, where it's, it's fairly isolated at this point and has been basically exclusive to, to moose in those countries. Now, when it comes to known risks for CWD transmission, just a couple that I want to touch on, and I'll mention one in a little bit, but um, I mean, again, uh, we talk about a lot of things that we don't know about CWD, and that's true. Uh, at the same time, we might not know a lot of very specific details or certain mechanisms, but I think we do know at this point enough that we can say definitively uh, some things pose a risk for CWD transmission. It's fairly obvious, but one is, of course, movement of live cervids. That can happen naturally with uh, free-ranging animals. We know that they move. Um, but I would argue, and I think many would as well, that the human-assisted movement has played a far greater role in the spread of CWD. Um, and again, this, this pertains to the movement of live animals, and it's not just 
uh, limited to captive servid uh, industry folks or farm survey owners who are transporting animals. Obviously, again, there's there's wildlife agencies who have skin in the game. There's a lot of talk about reintroductions of certain cervids. Um, and a lot of what this comes back to is just this idea that we do not have at this point uh, an extremely reliable, super sensitive, super specific uh, anti-mortem test, a test that we can use on live animals. There has been progress made in that area. Um, white-tailed deer specifically, if they have certain genotypes, we have uh, some tools available, um, but for the most part, it's it's one of those ongoing challenges in, in determining if a cervid that we're about to move is actually infected or not. Um, at the same time, it's not just limited to live animals, given the characteristics of CWD prions. We know that, again, they can remain infectious for quite a long time. So that means, you know, anytime you're moving um, parts containing these prions, so carcasses um, or carcass parts, uh, you could be moving the prion as well. And again, if it's if it enters into the environment um, and susceptible hosts interact with, you know, that carcass or a contaminated part, uh, there's always the, the possibility of introducing the disease to a new area, which is a concern. Uh, apart from the known risks for transmission, there are um, a couple of different things that are talked about as, as far as other potential risks, and I don't want to minimize those. Uh, one, of course, is, is sort of this idea that plants can uh, uptake prions and spread the disease. Again, I don't want to minimize that by any means. I just think, you know, in the spectrum of what poses a risk versus, you know, what's a little less of a concern. I think, you know, again, a lot of a lot of the problems we're dealing with likely relate to more of the the movement of live animals and the movement of carcasses as opposed to um, moving plants. I, I put this as an example. This was a story published in SIDRAP News by one of our news reporters uh, just recently that talks about um, the latest science um, looking at CWD prions and plants and their potential role. Again, a lot of this and this sort of permeates all of CWD research is that, you know, we get some information from laboratory studies and then the challenge is really applying that to what does this mean in the real world. Um, so again, don't want to minimize that concern. I just think at this point, it's it's really difficult to to know for sure what the risks are associated with that. Same thing, you know, when we talk about um, scents or urine, uh, scents that might contain urine, uh, potentially from inf infected animals, don't want to minimize that. I just think, you know, again, it's one of those things where we, we have more work to do in understanding that. So going back to the movement of live animals, um, I guess if you're not familiar, this in 2018, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, published a document that's extremely comprehensive, um, and it basically relates to the best management practices for um, for prevention, surveillance, management of CWD. Uh, and they have just, it's 111 pages. If you could read all of it, definitely encourage it. Um, but a lot of really good information that they post in there, including policy options, and then they actually include uh, the latest science as well to sort of justify why they're saying um, certain things or recommending certain things. Um, and so you can see that just up front, very early on in this document, they say flat out that movement of infected live animals is considered one of the greatest risks for spreading. Um, again, you can see that, you know, with cervids being free ranging animals, of course, their movement naturally plays a role and that's been implicated in, you know, transmissions to different states that you can see there. At the same time, as I just mentioned, you know, moving these live cervids from infected farms potentially without knowing they're infected. Um, we've also basically traced that back. We now know that, you know, Saskatchewan's CWD problem was likely uh, introduced by uh, an infected elk in South Dakota, same thing, in other states, and even South Korea. I mean, it was introduced there through this, this movement of live animals. But as it says, we can't, you know, go back and, and attribute all of this, this spread to movement of live animals. Um, there's certainly other things playing a role as well. So this brings us to the risks posed by cervid remains. Again, this was the, the topic of my PhD um, project that I did. And uh, there's, it goes back to the same principles we talked about earlier, but again, you can see that with just the resilience of these prions, if you bring an infected cervid and actually place it on the landscape, um, it would not be unlikely that other animals would interact with this, this carcass or carcass part. They're, of course, curious. And you can see that in some instances, this involves other cervids, which, of course, is a, a risk in that they are susceptible to CWD. 
Um, there's also studies that basically show, I think there's a study out of Wisconsin in 2007 where they put up cameras and basically found that a bunch of animals, scavengers, um, all sorts of things visited this these mortality sites, including cows, dogs, domesticated cats, other things. So of course, if these parts are left out in the environment, odds are they're probably going to be interacted with, which again, sort of introduced this risk of uh, introducing the disease to new areas. Another unfortunate part of the carcass remain issue is that some of these highest risk parts are often the ones that remain after processing. So we're talking about the spinal column, uh, the skull with brain material, uh, CWD prions would be uh, presumably in higher concentrations in those, those parts, which again, if they're left out, they would be the ones that are being disposed of. So if they're being disposed of improperly, it's, it's not ideal. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, a lot of this is sort of seen as a potential route for introducing the disease to new areas. Um, and if you work for a wildlife agency, you would know firsthand that, you know, disposal plans and importation restrictions, certain tools are being used and looked at and rules and regulations are being looked at to mitigate the risks associated with this. Oops, let's see if I can advance. Uh, this is another slide that I always include when I talk about carcass disposal because I find it fascinating. It's getting to be a bit more outdated, um, but this was put together by USGS and this actually tracks the home zip codes for hunters that traveled to one of four counties in Southwest Wisconsin and successfully harvested an animal. Um, unfortunately, these four counties, again, not too far, a stone's throw away from where I grew up, um, have extremely high prevalences of CWD, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. Um, and you can see that essentially hunters from all states in the U.S. Um, traveled there. And again, these are successful hunters, hunters who would have harvested an animal. Um, so you can see just where these folks live. And again, not to assume as they're not supposed to, that the carcasses of these animals were being taken back to their home zip codes. Um, you can imagine that in some cases, you know, that that might have happened or contaminated parts might have been brought back. So I think it just really captures the uh, potential risk of, again, introducing the disease to new areas and why carcass management is, is an important consideration. So again, if you read further down in the AFWA document, they actually, again, very comprehensive. They cover carcass disposal specifically. I mean, they lay out best management practices for reducing CWD transmission through disposal. Um, and essentially they lay out these, these five ideas, basically four unique ideas. One, of course, is incineration. Um, another being high pressure alkaline uh, hydrolysis, so chemical digestion. Composting has been mentioned as a potential tool. Um, and then an approved landfill uh, is listed as sort of the best management practice for um, housing servant carcasses. Unfortunately, even though we put out best management practices, we know that, you know, in the real world, things can get a little more complicated. That has been the case with this issue. Um, so with landfills in particular, um, the U.S. EPA, and I know this is more Canadian based, um, but I think there are some parallels. But essentially, the US EPA a while back put out uh, statements on cervic carcass disposal using Lyme municipal solid waste landfills and essentially said that, you know, it was an option that could be used. Um, if you actually look to as well, not to just, you know, out that I'm biased towards landfills, if you go back to that previous slide with the incineration, chemical digestion, et cetera, um, and read again, the AFWA document in more detail, they actually recommend that the byproducts from these disposal options are, again, eventually put into a landfill. So uh, at the end of the day, I think landfills, they they make it very clear in the AFWA document that landfills play a pretty key role um, in disposal, regardless of what route you're going with. Um, again, you can see that they highlight, you know, that it's an economically feasible option and can uh, allow for high volumes of carcasses. So pretty ideal when it comes to this topic. At the same time, I think in this may be a U.S. specific problem and even uh, state specific, depending on the state. Uh, there have been challenges uh, here just in convincing landfill operators to continue accepting survey carcasses as waste. Um, this was actually, again, laid out in that AFL report where you can see they're somewhat cryptic in their their uh, explanation of why they put out these policy options, but they said as many landfills begin to close or discontinue accepting, options for efficient disposal may become limited. Um, so that's really kind of the reality and the challenge that we're, we're facing and dealing with uh, and, and sort of inspired my PhD project. 
At the same time, I included some articles. I don't expect you to read it all, but you can see that in this case in Wyoming, um, they accepted 30 to 40 tons of wild game carcasses at a certain location that is no longer being allowed. So they basically have to find a new place. Um, Minnesota, where I am currently living now, it's been an issue for uh, the past five years, really. Um, but again, we're our agencies in the state are kind of running into this problem of, you know, if we're going to recommend serving carcass disposal, if we recognize that it's a risk, how do we best do it? And I think with sort of the first line preferred options, we're running into challenges where landfills may not be accepting them. And as it's highlighted in the bottom, we're really discovering there is not a perfect affordable way to dispose of them. And likewise, I just want to point out that it's not always specific to landfills and landfill operators. Um, obviously, you know, when you look at the waste stream, it's an entire long process of things, you know, that might not even come to mind at first. But this was an example, again, in 2019, um, where actually a landfill had uh, told the DNR that they would be willing to accept carcasses. However, they transported their leachate to a wastewater treatment plant and the wastewater treatment plant uh, essentially told them that they didn't want the risk. And so it sort of became this upstream, the landfill then was a little hesitant to accept it. So you can just sort of see how complex this, this gets. And so again, just to get into my PhD project, and this was the topic of the last webinar I did. So if you listen to that, this might be a bit redundant, um, but really what I was trying to do is characterize the US State Wildlife Agency um, plans. So again, very wildlife management, um, based. And that was, well, I'll get into that in a little bit, but then beyond the wildlife agencies, again, going back to this idea that, you know, waste management involves a lot of different entities and stakeholders. Uh, after characterizing the wildlife agency plans and approaches, I also wanted to look into what other agencies are doing. So again, departments of transportation, um, departments of agriculture, et cetera, and just see how their roles compared to the wildlife agencies and see if there are any gaps or barriers between them. And at the end, just sort of summarize what is um, being done in regards to serving carcass disposal and maybe um, move the ball forward in terms of how we might approach this issue uh, in the future. And so this is a two-phase project. Really, the first uh, was sending out questionnaires to state wildlife agencies that was done in 2022. Um, and after I got responses to that, I ended up uh, selecting a handful of states and doing interviews with state agency personnel. Again, that was across a number of state agencies. It wasn't just wildlife. It was um, a whole variety, which I'll show in a bit. So as far as the questionnaire goes, uh, again, we didn't exclude any states based on CWD status, um, mostly because if states didn't have CWD um, included in the survey was basically an uh, a way for them to provide information of, you know, are they still thinking about disposal? Uh, do they have anything that they would find helpful? Um, so I think there were lessons to be learned in, in states that didn't have CWD as well. But you can see um, I was fortunate enough through having connections and maybe emailing people too often um, to actually get responses from all 50 state agencies uh, by late August 2022. So 100% response rate. And likewise, I won't get into all of the details or results uh, if you want. Again, this dissertation is available on ProQuest, I believe. I don't know if it's easy to find. Uh, if you want to read it, always feel free to email me. Um, I also have like a spreadsheet as well with some of the responses in a bit more digestible form. So uh, just feel free to follow up with me. But just to give a sense of what was being covered in this survey, um, we wanted to understand the regulatory authority that state wildlife agencies had being wildlife, uh, if they actually thought about disposal again, um, what methods they were using, whether they were using dumpsters. And then, of course, you know, across the board, we wanted to understand if there were, was anything that would be helpful or could um, help better support them. And at the end was just understanding any challenges or obstacles they faced. On the other end, this is, again, fast forwarding to these interviews. Uh, just to give a sense of what that looked like. Uh, again, I tried to talk to a handful of folks from uh, a number of state agencies. This is across three states, Colorado, Minnesota, Pennsylvania. You can see in the table uh, the different state agencies that I talked to. Um, and that was from December to February 2023. And so just to go through some of the results, uh, this is from the survey. And again, up front, we thought it was important to sort of define, determine what the regulatory authority was in state wildlife agencies. Of course, we know that they have jurisdiction over uh, wildlife, 
but this is not an exclusive, as, as was mentioned in the introduction, this is not an issue that's exclusive to just wildlife. Um, and you can see that among the options proposed to them, um, the vast majority, apart from taxidermists and captive servants, really had somewhat limited authority when it came to other entities that might be involved um, in, in carcass disposal. So that was fairly enlightening in that regard. Um, at the same time, it was somewhat reassuring in that uh, understanding the vast majority of state wildlife agencies actually expressed having plans for CWD and specifically addressing carcass disposal on those plans, even if they hadn't detected the disease yet. And so you can see across the board, it, it was an issue that was being talked about and looked at, which is, is reassuring, especially in states that don't have the disease, just because, you know, having these plans up front is always preferable to sort of coming up with them on the, the fly. So that was reassuring. Um, and then when it came to the actual methods that were being used, you can see just very clearly, these were, again, among the 38 states that said they addressed um, disposal in either their plans or response. And the vast majority um, basically said that they used or relied on approved municipal waste landfills. Um, other than that, you can see that incineration was reportedly used by just over half of the state wildlife agencies, on-site burial, a little less than half, uh, chemical digestion, and then a few use composting. But otherwise, I think the main message, of course, is that landfills are sort of the bread and butter for carcass disposal um, recommendations by these agencies. On the other half of sort of that using or relying on landfills, it's, again, not just this easy, simple solution, unfortunately. Um, a lot of these agencies, even if they relied on them heavily, said explicitly that um, a lot of challenges they were facing were basically dealing with landfill operator hesitancy um, or just sort of, you know, maintaining access to these landfills. You can see that this was uh, um, an open text response received by one of the states, um, and they compare, you know, potentially positive animals to almost being viewed as a toxic substance. Uh, even though these landfill operators are sympathetic, they just rather not um, be involved. And again, it, it touches on concerns about even potential liability um, if landfills were um, to accept this waste, at least concerns or perception that they may be at risk of liability. So again, a, a deeply complex um, problem, and it's not always the same in every instance. So you can just sort of imagine um, what wildlife agencies are dealing with in this regard. Um, otherwise, I think another fairly uh, obvious and, and common response was that accessibility when it came to disposal was, was a challenge. Uh, even in places that did have landfills that would allow for disposal, um, you can imagine if you're a pretty big state or province um, and you have these landfills, it might be quite a long drive for certain hunters or folks who are looking to dispose of animals. They have to drive, you know, an hour, two hours, et cetera. Uh, it becomes a challenge for even, even having you know, animals dispose of where you're sort of suggesting that they are. Um, again, not even limited to landfills. You can see that, you know, with incinerators, same sort of story, digesters. I know I did talk after my last webinar, um, which exclusively covered the PhD project. It does sound like there are, you know, options such as mobile incinerators. I think that does hold some potential, especially in states that may not have the disease yet. Um, but again, we're talking about cost scale. They're, they're much smaller than sort of air curtain incinerators. Um, but again, sort of options to think about in that regard. Um, otherwise, a topic that gets quite a bit of discussion, maybe, well, at least here in the Midwest, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, is this idea of state wildlife agencies putting out dumpsters, um, making dumpsters available as sort of temporary sites for collecting cervid remains. Um, when we asked if state wildlife agencies were doing this, just over a quarter of them said that they were. Um, however, I think when we we basically allowed for some follow up and wanted to get some more context on the dumpster issue. And again, unfortunately, they were not a straightforward, simple solution. There were a lot of logistical challenges associated with dumpsters, where to cite them, how many to have, the costs associated with them, who's going to pick them up, who's going to transfer them. Um, you name it, it was it was sort of a challenge. Likewise, I thought it was interesting where, you know, some states that had basically, the wildlife agencies had, had been paying for these dumpsters, um, they've sort of set a precedent or at least have 
express that they set a precedent where now anytime they have detections in potentially a new area, they almost feel obligated to, you know, put dumpsters in that area. So they almost saw it as like a continuing cost unless they eventually take dumpsters away, which might lead to some disappointment from the public that likes it or legislators or whatever. Um, I think they they expressed that they didn't necessarily think about, you know, setting this precedent of putting out dumpsters every time there's a new detection. So again, more things to think about in that regard. Otherwise, I think a, a main key point that really came out of this project was, you know, we basically asked if state wildlife agencies were offering targeted guidance to certain groups when it came to disposal. As you can imagine, the vast majority said they were giving it to hunters. Um, some gave it to taxidermists, uh, less so when it came to processors, captive servant landfills. Um, but anyway, if they mentioned that they were giving targeted guidance, we followed up and basically asked, you know, in your opinion, how well are they complying with uh, your regulations, policies, recommendations? And I think it was pretty apparent across the board that, you know, in most cases, almost half the time, wildlife agencies were totally unsure as to what the levels of compliance were among these groups. And again, these are groups that are getting targeted guidance and targeted information on carcass disposal. Um, and so I think that was a pretty, um, pretty eye opening finding and just that, you know, we can put out recommendations or put rules into place. But of course, one of the challenges is understanding just how often um, and how likely those rules are to be followed. So I thought that was important to draw out. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, sort of getting to that same regard in, in terms of compliance, um, just this ability to actually, you know, oversee rules and recommendations or to sort of enforce rules and recommendations is somewhat limited. Uh, it doesn't obviously mean that they're worthless by any means, but I think it just shows the the reality of you know, putting out rules and regulations. If we don't really have a great way of one, measuring compliance and two, um, sort of enforcing the rules that we have in place, um, it becomes a challenge. Likewise, I think a lot of you know, you know, especially in places that have had CWD for quite a while, um, wildlife managers understand that, you know, we all learned sort of firsthand with COVID, um, just how, how much public buy-in and public sort of sentiment can play a role in rules and regulations. And in terms of COVID, we saw, you know, that it didn't take too long before people started getting a little tired of hearing about it. Same thing applies with CWD, even over longer time periods where, you know, some of these respondents mentioned that general apathy or disease fatigue that they're, they're dealing with. Um, and I didn't really include a lot of specific examples from the interviews that I did, because of course it's very text heavy. A lot more quotes are featured in the dissertation. So again, if you want that, I can send it to you. Um, but just some key results that, that came out of that, um, one was that cross-agency collaboration, especially mentioned by wildlife agencies, was, was commonly talked about, uh, per but perceived effectiveness could vary quite a bit. Um, and just to give two examples of that, I mean, one state that I talked to basically said that cross-agency collaboration was absolute gold for them when it came to carcass disposal. I mean, they essentially said that they worked with their you know, environmental agency and were really able to keep landfill landfills accessible um their what their environmental agency understood the problem worked very closely with them to sort of um keep this keep their program going and make it effective on the other hand there were instances where there maybe was sort of these task force or you know cross agency um, meetings but the wildlife agency essentially expressed that they felt like they were on their own when it came to the this issue so um, I think it really depended on sort of that buy-in from even the environmental agencies um, and that relationship and what um, sort of that, that picture looked like and what they'd be willing to do. Um, another sort of key point that came out was that, um, you know, when we talk about, and I'll get into the contingency planning project here at the end, um, but just in talking about, you know, disposal and perceptions of disposal, um, it was interesting to note that, you know, it's capacity to infect or this un, unproven capacity to infect humans um, actually lowered concerns about associated risks with handling. Um, maybe for additional context as well, at the same time that I was talking to these folks, uh, high path avian influenza was happening, um, which, of course, is more of a recognized um, zoonotic issue. Um, and so I think, you know, at this point, that 
that lack of evidence of CWD transmission to humans was was acting as sort of a benefit in that, you know, maybe some landfill operators or environmental agencies um, felt that disposal using landfills, et cetera, um, was more tolerable because of that lack of, of transmission. Um, another thing is just risk perception. Um, of course, transportation departments were actively involved, but their procedures could vary. Uh, I found instances where even in states, even in parts of states where there were was CWD detections, um, you know, transportation department personnel would essentially say that their practices had not changed um, whatsoever. They're still just essentially dragging the the roadkill out of sight, out of mind, um, but leaving it on the landscape. Um, and then, of course, as everyone knows that's familiar with the disease, uh, I think just the sheer amount of uncertainty um, surrounding this issue really exacerbates, you know, understanding what the best approach is, um, what the best guidance is, um, and just answering questions and keeping people informed in general. Um, I think it, it becomes a challenge across the board, but it's also true with disposal. And so some key findings, I'll just run through these quick because a lot of it is, again, I talked about in the last webinar and it's reiterated in the dissertation, but obviously I think first and foremost is just understanding the state wildlife agency authority. And it's mostly limited, which really impacts, you know, the amount of oversight that they had on this issue. Uh, most states had plans. However, I think, you know, for the states that didn't have plans or didn't address disposal, uh, just demonstrates that there are still lingering vulnerabilities in this area. Um, and nearly every state that was involved, of course, relied heavily on landfills as a primary method. Um, I think it's good that landfills, at least in these places, are being, you know, used and are available for disposal. I just think it's also concerning that, you know, if landfills did end up going away um, for whatever reason, it appears that there are few, if any, alternative options that would be available. Um, on the other hand, just the development and application of targeted guidance um, was typically limited to just a few select entities. Like I said, hunters uh, predominantly got the guidance, maybe taxidermists, processors, um, but it was far less common for uh, groups like landfills or wastewater treatment plants to actually hear uh, from wildlife agencies and receive guidance on this issue from wildlife agencies. Um, so that, again, represents sort of an avenue that could be approached uh, if you're thinking about this issue and keeping stakeholders on board. Um, and at the end here, I just revealed the stark reality was that most state level agencies overseeing disposal really had very limited insight as to what true levels of compliance were with their guidance or rules. Um, and so just taking that and moving forward, um, I think, you know, stepping into the shoes of wildlife agencies, it's, it's fairly obvious, um, that a lot of time resources, staff, um, are required to, to really focus and emphasize survey carcass disposal. At the same time, we really don't, at this point, uh, understand a lot of the, the cost benefit of these investments. Um, and so that was one thing that really came out, a key point that came out from this project was just uh, undertaking more of these comprehensive cost benefit analyses whenever possible on prioritizing those. Um, and so I said, you know, again, just looking at ways, and I know it's not going to be perfect and it's not easy, but looking at ways to really better assess compliance, I think would be very helpful in this regard. I think it would help, you know, show if, if you put a lot of time and thought and energy into these rules and regulations, just getting at least some sense of, you know, um, are they being followed? How often are they being followed? Um, and adapting based on that would be, would be good. Um, in addition, I think, you know, considering overall survey mortality is another key key part to this. Um, and again, this is not me downplaying the risk of or the importance of survey carcass disposal, um, but just thinking of the bigger picture in general. Um, and so this is a calculation for the U.S., not necessarily Canada, but you can see that, you know, between hunting and animal vehicle collisions alone, there's roughly 7.3 million survey carcasses generated in the U.S. on an annual basis. And so you can sort of do this mental you know, thought experiment of just imagining one, how many of these animals are infected. Um, you know, in some states, it might be quite a few and others, it might be uh, much less of them, but just, you know, thinking through the risk of, you know, these are, again, animals that are infected in their cervids or their carcasses would, would pose risks for um, introducing the disease. And then just imagining that of those, how many are properly disposed of. And so again, just you know, if we're going to put guidance and rules in place, uh, 
um, just understanding the scope and scale of that, you know, if, is it effective if, you know, we get 10% of the infected uh, carcasses off the landscape? Um, is it 50% that we're taking off the landscape? Are there ways that we can, you know, in, improve that proportion? Um, I think that would, again, really just be important for helping inform um, strategies for disposal moving forward. And I think, you know, the ultimate question for me, at least after this project was just trying to understand, you know, if disposal would remain a viable, sustainable option for CWD management, not to, again, just bring everything back to landfills, but I think it was very apparent that landfills play a pretty key role um, in strategies for disposal. But unfortunately, like I said, I think the, the general trend is that fewer and fewer are becoming uh, available or at least uh, continuing to allow disposal, um, which, which leads to challenges down the road. And this is another slide I just added that's um, certainly not comprehensive. And of course, as a disclaimer, I'm not a wildlife manager. So um, by no means am I saying that this is exhaustive, but just maybe some things to consider, especially if you're in places, um, you know, thinking about disposal and other management strategies. You know, first, it's not necessarily a, a surprise, but I think it's important to obviously look at your current disease status. I think, you know, especially for disposal, or certain initiatives or certain strategies, um, the effectiveness of it would probably hinge quite a bit on your disease status. So I would say if you don't, if you haven't detected CWD or if it's been recently detected, um, I think you know the emphasis that could be placed on disposal um, and the efforts and you know basically the efforts that are put into disposal would probably be more warranted. Um, on the other hand. You know, if you look at places, again, like Southwest Wisconsin, where I'm from, not to say that it's not worth it to think about those things, but you can imagine when you have prevalence of 30 to 50 percent, um, you know, wildlife agencies, is it worth investing a lot of money into dumpsters and other things? Again, not to say that it's just throw your hands in the air and, and call it good enough and just do nothing. But again, I think it's important to sort of think about these things to help define your goals and really prioritize what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, at the same time, you know, understanding your regulatory authority and available resources. Again, I know it's it's the dilemma that every agency faces, but just you know, how much access to funding do you have? Where does the funding come from? How much staffing do you have? Um, and then again, what is your authority? Um, it really helps clarify the tools that you would have available. Likewise, you know, understanding partner agency authority. Um, so if you have an environmental agency that you work closely with. Um, potentially having, you know, connections or explaining to them um, what you're sort of seeking, why you're seeking it, again, I think would be sort of a, a really good step to take um, if you are really, you know, emphasizing carcass disposal as a strategy. Um, and then, of course, this is sort of a, a an area where you could come up with, you know, millions of questions potentially, but just better understanding stakeholder perception and behavior, I think, is key. Um, you know, I think in the, the surveys and the interviews that I conducted, there was a lot of talk about, you know, wildlife agencies potentially having concerns that, you know, the rules for a certain part of the state are highly complex when it comes to disposal. Um, and it might, you know, vary quite a bit. They might have like a CWD, you know, management zone versus surveillance zone. And it ended up coming like in these situations, there might've been layers of rules that depending on where hunters are hunting, um, they might have to understand, you know, sort of different levels of rules. And in some cases, they basically said, you know, maybe it'd be easier to just implement, you know, a statewide or province-wide rule um, and make it, you know, easier to understand um, and less confusing to, to folks. So I think, you know, always going back to this idea of, of how reasonable and clear are they is important. Likewise, I think, you know, if you're a state without CWD um, and it, you're focusing on carcass disposal, I think it's, you know, pretty key to understand or at least get a better sense of how many hunters are traveling out of province to hunt. Uh, if there's any way that, you know, you could possibly try to get a better sense of, you know, where is the most common place that they're going? Is it an area with CWD? Um, how often are they going? Things like that. Um, and then, you know, again, I know it's easier said than done, but just trying to better understand what common practices are if they do successfully harvest a cervid. A lot of places obviously have, you know, carcass importation restrictions and rules put in place. Um, but again, just better understanding, you know, is that message being 
getting across to hunters? Are they following that? Um, and trying to come up with potentially enforcement mechanisms that might uh, draw on that would be uh, worth looking at. Likewise, I think another thing, and this was, I, I put it as a question in the survey and I didn't show the, the picture, but um, you know, when you think about waste streams, I think it is important to consider um, you know, the processing setting for these animals. Um, and so if, if you look, and I wish I'd, I should have put the picture up, but uh, if you look across the U.S., I mean, it is quite interesting how, you know, in certain regions, there might be states where, you know, more than three quarters of the animals, um, and this is based on the opinion of the, the folks who filled out the surveys, but there might be states where, you know, 75 plus percent of the animals are, are taken to a commercial facility for processing. And other states, it might be the exact opposite, where 75 plus are uh, processed by the hunter themselves. Um, and I know it's a lot of those were based on just, you know, opinions and, and some estimates, but I think better understanding, you know, where these animals are taken and where they're being processed could play a pretty key role if you're going to focus on carcass disposal, um, just in where you might prioritize interventions or methods. Again, if you know, the vast majority of these animals are being taken to a meat processor. Um, it might be more worth, you know, talking to the processor and educating and working with the processor as opposed to, you know, explaining rules to hunters um, when they may not be, you know, ending up with the, the final product in the carcass. So again, just things to think about in that regard. So that is sort of the end of part one of this talk and part two will be much shorter, I promise. Um, that was the PhD project I completed again, that was published last year. Um, fortunately, while I was getting my PhD and then now, of course, I've been uh, at SIDRAP. And as was mentioned, we're currently working on this contingency planning project related to CWD. And so just want to give a better sense of sort of one, what SIDRAP does, um, why we do it, and then kind of touch on and what we're we're doing in terms of this project specifically. So I pulled this from the website, um, but if you're not familiar, SIDRAP, it's, it's a mouthful when it's not put in the acronym, but the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy um, is really a public health entity, and it's become a global leader in addressing preparedness and emerging infectious disease response. Uh, it was founded in 2001 and is part of the University of Minnesota. And really our whole goal is to prevent illness and death from infectious disease threats um, on a global basis. And a lot of that is through translation of, of science into research and, and or into policy and, and guidance. And so just to highlight, you know, we're not exclusive. The CIDREP is by no means, um, you know, a CWD only focused um, group. We actually have just over a dozen ongoing efforts and they span a whole number of infectious disease topics. Um, if you're not familiar, again, we have full-time news staff. So I think there's at least four or five uh, full-time news reporters who report again, specific, specifically on infectious disease topics. Um, we have a program that addresses antimicrobial resistance and how we might combat that, a resilient drug supply program, uh, a pretty rich vaccine R&D roadmap program, which I'll actually touch on here in a second. And then of course the, the CWD program um, as well. So in terms of CWD, this actually started in 2019. Um, I just got my master's, which was focused on CWD in 2018 um, before starting. But um, I guess our first sort of task or goal was to put together a web page that covered CWD in a, in a fairly comprehensive way. Um, we do similar things when it comes to, again, these other infectious disease topics, our antimicrobial stewardship program has their own web page with a, a similar layout. Likewise, when COVID became a problem, um, we have a COVID-19 uh, web page as well. And basically what we're trying to do is not, you know, recreate the wheel by any means, but again, having a news reporter report on the latest news, um, putting together resources like the CWD Alliance, AFWA, just directing folks to uh, these resources, having frequently asked questions, et cetera. And, of course, we do occasional webinars, podcasts, monthly newsletters. So that started in 2019, and it was sort of based on, you know, a lot of these, these programs that we have at SIDREP. Now, this is shifting gears slightly, but I think it's important context. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, SIDREP does have a number of vaccine R&D roadmaps. The only reason I bring this up is because, you know, back in, after the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, uh, the World Health Organization actually put together a list of priority pathogens where they're basically wanting 
uh, research and development roadmap laid out of how can we better um, come up with diagnostics, vaccines, therapeutics, um, and get from you know where we're at now to a more ideal situation. Um, so they came up with a list of all these different pathogens, and actually for I think more than half of them, uh, SIDRAP was was basically granted the uh, the oversight of putting together these roadmaps. And so you can see from Ebola, Marburg, Nipah, Zika, um, SIDRAP has led that initiative for the WHO. Likewise, it, these aren't WHO exclusive projects, but uh, they're not included on the list. We've done similar things for influenza um, and COVID as well. And I bring up the COVID one because I actually had the privilege of working on that um, project. And again, really what this involved is, is bringing together the world's experts um, across the board, again, from virology to vaccinology to, to funding, you name it, um, bringing them together, assessing what the, the latest science is, assessing what we need, how we get there, um, when we need it by, and really trying to lay out in a step-by-step -step basis, you know, like where we need to go. Um, and so again, it was a very enlightening experience working on that and just impressive to, to sort of see the, the amount of experts um, that were totally bought in and willing to help. And so just, again, it's not an exact replica of what we're doing with the CWD contingency project, but I think, you know, there's enough parallels that it's worth just pointing out where um, in a similar regard, just understanding where we're at with the latest science, understanding the knowledge gaps and barriers, uh, developing this roadmap, and then really, um, you know, we we sort of see ourselves at CIDREP as air traffic control, um, or more or less just relying heavily on subject matter experts to to explain to us, you know, what they're dealing with it, um, what might help, um, and trying to piece that together. So as far as uh, this project goes specifically, it was mentioned earlier, but this was uh, supported very generously by the, the Minnesota State Legislature during the last 2000 or 2023 session. Um, and we're taking a general approach, again, not totally mirroring, but taking an approach that's very similar to the work that we've done with the, the roadmap projects in the past. And again, a lot of that hinges on this convening of subject matter experts. Um, and so at this time, We've really pulled together 68 total experts um, and placed them in these five priority working group topic areas. You can see in the table it spans from human medicine, and public health, to servant and production animal health, to diagnostics, um, disposal, and then wildlife health and conservation. You can also see that 10 of these experts um, have basically agreed to, to help shepherd these groups along by serving as co-chairs. Um, and so we're, we're very appreciative for them as well. And I guess just to give a better sense of what we're actually doing with this, you know, we we talked about and planned, you know, the best approach for coming up with a contingency broad our contingency plan for CWD. Um, what we came up with is essentially a scenario planning uh, based activity, and so we're essentially meeting multiple times with these working groups um, and working through a number of scenarios. You can see scenario one deals with the status quo, so that's the current situation. Um, but then eventually moving into more of the hypothetical, um, you know, if we saw a suspect or confirmed case in a non-servant production animal like a cow or pig, um, we saw a suspect or confirmed case in a human, um, we're going to be talking about these in these working groups across all of the five working groups um, having these discussions. And so for each, we've developed a lot of critical questions that we try to tailor to each working group. Um, they're presented and again, discussed um, with members. And our overarching focus really is just trying to understand, again, what do we know? What do we not know? What do we need to find out? Um, and then, again, a lot of this is, is tailored back to this uh, possible spillover event. And so at this time, I mean, the latest update that I have is that all five working groups have um, now met twice. We have another round of meetings scheduled in March and throughout March. Um, and at this point, we've essentially wrapped up scenario one. So again, sort of the lay of the land as we know it now, and we'll be moving into more of the, the hypotheticals um, when it comes to possible spillover. And so as far as, you know, deliverable from this and an end goal from this, um, you know, essentially our, our goal is to take the information that we get from these discussions um, and put the key insights and recommendations that we sort of draw from these discussions into an interim report. 
that should be completed by the end of 2024. Um, and of course, included in that report would really, again, go back to this current state of CWD related research, uh, identifying those knowledge gaps that exist and barriers, um, and then really trying to lay out a blueprint of actions that would better prepare organizations. So whether it's agencies, laboratories, public health, et cetera, um, getting everyone sort of on the same page uh, for what their role might be and what they might have to consider if there ever was uh, a spillover event that occurred. Um, and I guess we really sort of see this to to better frame it. We see this as a living document. Um, you know, even even with the experts that are included, we know that it's not an entirely exhaustive list, and we obviously want as many perspectives as we can get and understand that again, you can come up with sort of these recommendations, but they have to be rooted in the real world. So it's going to be this ongoing iterative process, and we hope to uh, sort of work with agencies and again these other organizations. Um, even after this interim report is developed and continue to refine it and make it available. And again, hopefully it serves as a, as a helpful resource. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think we'd all, you know, rather not see a spillover event, but I think having these discussions now and, and thinking about, you know, what could happen now, what we might need to plan for now uh, is, is much more preferable to, you know, coming up with things in, in real time. Should we ever see, uh, that situation occur. And so with that, that is all I have. Like I said, I knew that would be fairly long, um, but hopefully it was helpful. If you have any questions, more than happy to, to answer them. Otherwise, you can see my email is at the bottom. So if you want a copy of the dissertation or the slides or or anything else, feel free to reach out. I'd be happy to to get that to you. So thank you again. I wanted to thank you. That was super interesting. So I know I listened to your first carcass disposal talk and I learned a lot again the second time. So I guess if anyone has questions, um, put them in the chat and then we can read them out and hopefully get them answered. I didn't leave a whole lot of time for questions. So I think I, uh, you overwhelmed I'll... everyone. Yeah. And I mean, worst comes to worst, if there's questions after, like you said, either they can email you or they can let us know and we'll we'll send you an email. Okay, well, I think oh, it's two. New... Oh, those are just thank yous. They're Sorry, all thank yous. Yeah. So I think I think you really overwhelmed everyone because it was well, so informative. So thank you so much for your time and putting this together for us. We really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. And like I said, again, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to talk. So appreciate it.